Our next speaker, I think, falls in this category of people we're seeing today who, who are many things and who do many things. I mean, we saw from Bob, who took his career in finance and now is working on how you apply financial issues to, to younger people, from Charlotte, whose career has been so interesting. Noreen Mirage is many things. She is a poet. She's a former high school guidance counselor. She's trying to find ways to take innovation and improve K through 12 education. She's also a gamification expert. And gamification is basically when you apply aspects of games to the real world. So in her case, she's trying to apply them to workplaces and figure out if you make aspects of work more like a game, then how can you make employees collaborate better together? And I want to read you one definition of gamification. It says it describes a movement in the tech world to add games to non-game stuff. The purpose of gamification is to make boring, uninspiring tasks fun by triggering the part of your brain that made you or your kids play Tetris for hours on end. And there's a brief example of how she applies that. She, she holds workshops sometimes with employees in which they're all encouraged to get together and list all the problems at the place where they work. And as she says, if you bring a lot of people in, it's probably easy to get them to do a lot of griping. But then they're basically told to work for solutions. And the person who comes up with the great solutions is given a prize, and that prize is considered the game element. So interesting ways to subtly bring aspects of game into work. So Noreen Mirage, welcome to you as well. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here. So we got a little bit of an introduction already about what gamification is. Um, but I just want to get a sense of um, the audience you know, and how much you know about gamification. Um, raise your hand if this is the first time you're hearing about gamification. Oh, wow, OK, a good number of you. And raise your hand if you've heard of gamification before. OK, good, so I think it's about 50-50. Of those of you who have your hands up on that second one, um, how many of you feel you understand it well enough to the extent where you've actually used it in some form or manner? OK, so just a few. Well, at the risk of you know, just uh, reiterating a little bit about what's already been said, um, I just want to quickly go over um, what gamification is. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, um, you know, as it was just said, gamification is basically applying games to real life. Um, it taps into three of our innate human needs, competition, progression, and recognition. The competition factor is, you know, we all like to compete against one another. We sometimes like to compete against ourselves. We all want to be the best at something. Progression. We want to see ourselves moving forward. We want to get better and better at whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. And we want to see ourselves complete the task at hand, right? It's, it's nice to see a finished product, if you will. Um, and then, of course, recognition. I mean, who doesn't like to be rewarded for a job well done, right? I mean, it's always a nice feeling to be recognized for that, and even if it's just for the effort. So uh, you know, really what it uh, comes down to is that Gamification is a trendy buzzword for behavior modification, or actually, better yet, uh, behavior reinforcement. Unfortunately, um, people often mistake gamification for just the obvious game mechanics um, that it often entails. Um, so for example, um, game mechanics such as you know, applying points or, or badges or having a leaderboard for some kind of process, you know, things that you would typically find um, in, a, in a video game. Video game. Um, but actually, you know, gamification is so, so much more than just the game mechanics that it entails. Gamification is about immersive experiences and self-discovery and self-empowerment and incentives and rewards. It's, all sorts of things. It's about the experience is what it comes down to. So really, the best way for me to showcase the power of gamification is to apply it to a real world problem. Now, I apply it to work issues in the technology field, um, which I work in now, applied every day. But gamification can be used for so much more. So the problem that I'm going to talk about today is something that I feel, well, first of all, it's close to my heart. And then um, it's something that I feel is critical to the success of our country in the upcoming years. Um, 
And that uh, topic is how to raise global citizens using gamification. So first, let's ask, you know, what is a global, global citizen? So a global citizen um, is someone who doesn't just uh, understand, um, you know, geography on a map or reads about different cultures or takes on a foreign language or two. Um, these are people who have, um, who are instinctively understanding that the world is interconnected. And what are actu our actions that take place in, you know, say Boston, Massachusetts, affect the lives of people in Liberia? I mean, think about this. If we were to develop a vaccine for Ebola here, it would impact the health crisis there, right? So why is it important for us here in the US to raise global citizens? Well, the first question to ask is, what is the problem that we're actually trying to solve? I feel like we're continuing to raise a generation of children who are just isolated from the rest of the world. You know, they don't know or understand our neighbors. They don't understand uh, the different cultures and religions. Um, in fact, um, I want to actually show you something, and uh, viewer discretion is advised on this one. Take a look at this. This is a visual from the Guardian newspaper in the UK, which uh, depicts how the world thinks we viewed them. So just take a moment to take it in. Yeah, uh, pretty offensive, isn't it? Um, well, I didn't put this up there to offend anyone, um, but really I just wanted to give you a sense of sort of an exaggerated flavor of the stereotypes that many of us have um, about the rest of the world. And, you know, similarly, there's a few choice things that I've heard them say about us too, so it kind of goes both ways. So, you know, at this point, I'm sure some of you might be thinking, well, why exactly is this our problem? And um, some people might even say, well, why should we even care? Well, we care because America thrives for two reasons. Um, like it or not, we are a nation of immigrants, and probably over 99% of you are a byproduct of that. We attract the best and the brightest from all over the world. And we give them the same opportunities that we give our own. And that's what makes us great. We provide opportunity. The second reason is that we export our, our values, our goods, our services all over the place around the world, right? People worldwide look up to our music. They look up to our iconic brands. They um, look up to our philosophies around freedom and democracy. We enable an environment of creativity and innovation. So opportunity and innovation. Not the big guns, opportunity and innovation. And we need to carry on doing these things well. But if we continue to teach our kids to live in isolation, we're not going to continue to thrive. And the world is getting smaller. Technology is making the world smaller. We, we need to do more. And the only way that we are going to do these things well is to understand, uh, empathize, and appreciate the different cultures, values, and religions of the global community. We need to understand where others are coming from, we need to understand their pains, and we need to understand their stories. So now that I've told you why this is a critical problem uh, to solve, uh, what are people doing about it today? Well, sometimes they just have their head in the sand. You know, if, if we ignore it, it'll go away. Well, as I said, the world's getting smaller. It's not gonna go away. By and large, the majority of uh, educational institutions are not doing much. You know, perhaps they're not able to do much. Maybe it's financial cutbacks. Maybe it's politics of some sort. I don't know. It doesn't matter what the reason is. But they're just not doing as much as they should. And I'm not trying to sound pessimistic at all, but in my 15 years of experience in the educational space, I just haven't seen any real serious emphasis on addressing this issue of isolation. Um, now, there are some institutions that are trying, um, and uh, perhaps, you know, there are a few successful ones, you know, one or two here and there. But for the most part, the ones that are trying, um, their approach is not very effective. So, you know, they try to add classes like 
uh, you know, your foreign language classes and your world civilization classes, you know, along with some cursory description of other cultures to the curriculum, but they're not immersing their students. They're not immersing them, and as a result, they're not motivating them to internalize, you know, internalize what they're learning. These classes, they become a chore. Uh, most of the time, these kids are just checking off a box, um, you know, to get the credits that they need to graduate, you know, doing the minimal amount of work um, to just move forward, get out, and go to the real world. Of course, they don't know what the real world, world entails. But unfortunately, they're just not very engaged in school, and, it for, and they forget all that they learned as soon as they have completed the class. So I do feel that there's a better approach, um, and it's all about turning this chore into a game, of course. Um, because, you know, we all know that children love playing games. So, you know, remember when, um, let's, let's go back in time a little bit. Remember when you were four years old, how much you loved going to preschool? Do you guys remember what, you know, for some of us it might be a little bit longer than others, but uh, we loved going to preschool. And that was because most of our learning was happening through playing games. But as you got older, things changed, learning changed. And now, you know, fast forward to grade four, and when you were asked, what's your favorite subject? Be honest, how many of you said recess? Yeah, <laughs> be honest, I know it was more than, <laughs> more than that. Okay, for the rest of you, did you say lunch? Because I know kids say that all the time, right? So why, why are they saying that? I mean, at the very most, we might then hear, you know, physical education or something. Well, the reason is because it was their opportunity to get out and play. It was their opportunity, that one opportunity that they had in the day where they were away from those endlessly boring lessons. Think about this. Um, why is it that when kids play Call of Duty, they tend to learn more about World War II than they do in history class? Well, here are the reasons why. It's immersive. And I know I keep saying that word, but it's a really important part of the learning process. It's immersive. They are experiencing it. And it has the three important uh, gamification elements that I talked about a moment ago. Um, the, you know, competition, progression, recognition. The competition is, you know, they're playing with and against their friends and their peers. Um, they can instantly see their progress as they play the game. And then there's lots of rewards and recognition, of course, you know, as they gain points and move from one level to the next. And then they become known as experts in the game among their circle of friends and game players. Experts. That's such a good feeling to be called an expert, isn't it? So that's not a tangible, extrinsic reward. That's a very intrinsic reward. But it's so, it just feels good. It's challenging, but it's so gratifying. And then finally, what I think is probably the most important, well, they're enjoying it. They're enjoying it. And what happens when you enjoy something? When you enjoy something, we want to continue, you want to continue experiencing it. When you experience something, you learn and understand and retain it better. And when you retain it better, you actually leverage it and utilize it more in real world problems that you face later. So here's where I want to introduce this concept that I call the playful village and why I think this approach could very well be more effective. So in her book, uh, It Takes a Village, Hillary Clinton uh, emphasizes how children are not just raised by their parents, but also all the other people in the society uh, around them. And she goes on to say that this includes institutions like schools and uh, you know, businesses, government. You know, they all have an obligation to consider the impact um, on the children that they affect. So it's really about advocating the belief that we are all in it together versus, hey buddy, you're on your own. No one is on their own. The actions that we do, the decisions that we make, doesn't only affect us or the people that we know, but the greater population of people that we don't know in some form or manner. And similarly, 
you know, actions and decisions that other people make, it affects, it, com it could come back to us. So we have to keep that, that in mind, especially as we teach our children and help them grow. So now the village can be very effective with this learning process because you're not just learning textbook theory or hearing media sound bites, right? You're actually learning through immersive interaction in all aspects of your life with your neighbors, your friends, students from different backgrounds, um, classrooms from around the world. I mean, Skype education is becoming more and more popular. Um, it's, just, it's not limited to just your local school anymore. But we also have to, we also have to make this uh, immersive experience fun, rewarding, and competitive, you know, in a healthy sort of way. Um, and that's where the playful part of the village comes in. So by using a series of games, you're not just teaching the kids the theory of you know, multicultural or global awareness, but rather you're making them experience it. And uh, as we know, experiential learning is probably the most powerful form of learning. So I have introduced um, two ideas, two important ideas so far, um, that gamified learning is effective and that you have to apply gamified learning to the entire ecosystem the playful village, as I call it, and um, so that it's immersive and it's, it's engaging. Now, how do you take that and uh, translate these concepts into concrete actions? So what I'm gonna do now is give you a real world example of something I did utilizing gamification uh, within, a school, within a school district. So um, as you were told, I used to be a guidance counselor. Um, and some years back, I was working with the guidance department of West Boylston High School um, here in West Boylston, uh, West Boylston, Massachusetts. Now, this is a predominantly, uh, predominantly white middle class community with almost 90% of the population born and raised in the surrounding area. So one can imagine how a non-native student who is, you know, for whatever reason, thrown in the middle of this, um, may have felt, you know, the sea of students who look and act differently than themselves. You know, a lot of thoughts go through their mind, right? Uh, how do I fit in? Um, will people judge me because of my ethnicity or my religion or where I come from? But on the flip side, you know, we cannot disregard the plethora of emotions that even the white majority students could be feeling as well. They have questions too. You know, what is the politically correct way to address somebody? Um, you know, will I be offending the person if I say something, you know, just because I'm curious? Um, will I be deemed a racist if I refer to them in a certain way? So what happens oftentimes, people just don't communicate. So, you know, not for lack of trying, um, but often at this school there was a difficulty in sustaining a, a multicultural and global conscious environment. So as the school slowly started to increase in diversity, the administration became more and more concerned with you know, whether uh, they were promoting an appreciation of multicultural voices in the classroom, whether they were encouraging students to question and openly discuss critical global issues. So not just pertaining to things going on in their backyard there in central Massachusetts, but you know, on a global level, things they heard in the news, things that were happening elsewhere. And, were they truly preparing these young people to live in a globally interconnected society? So how I addressed this uh, was by creating an initiative called MAPS, which stands for, or stood for, uh, Multicultural Awareness Program for Students, um, in which I aligned gamified activities with certain classroom curriculum and assignments. So for instance, um, during an English or a foreign language or a social studies class, uh, where students were expected to do an assignment pertaining to current events or different cultures. Um, I would work with the teachers to have uh, gamified activities integrated into the learning environment. So one example of gamified learning there is that I'd have students pair up with a classmate that they didn't know well, um, and uh, they would need to learn relevant information about their cultural background. So, um, you know, side note here, even if they were Caucasian, both of them, very likely that they came from, you know, their ancestors came from different countries. So it was still a learning experience and something to, you know, do, dive into. But, so then I didn't just limit it to the school environment. You know, I asked the students to really experience a day in the life of a fellow classmate. You know, find, go over to their house, find out what they ate at home, what kind of clothes did they wear, walk around in their shoes, literally. 
Um, you know, where were they worshiping? How were they worshiping? What holidays were they celebrating? Do they celebrate it the same way we celebrate holidays? So all those questions. And their findings would be incorporated into written assignments in which they would uh, compete with other students uh, or student pairs, I should say, to find out how many similarities they had in spite of the obvious appearing differences. So integrating gamification within their entire ecosystem or the village um, resulted in an, you know, so much more of an enriching and uh, immersive learning experience. So once they had spent a good portion of the school year learning about diversity through you know, the various uh, subjects, they had an opportunity, share, an opportunity to share what they learned by presenting to their peers. And the pictures that you're seeing up here um, are actually a variety of a variety show that they uh, put together. Um, and you know, they, were able, they were able to then uh, showcase their own heritage or choose to be a part of someone else's if they, want, if they wanted to. And they did this through song and dance and you know, skits about um, events and history that impacted their ancestors, uh, literary readings, um, oh gosh, fashion shows, you name it. And as a result, you know, their participation got them their incentives. You know, they, it resulted in uh, you know, getting extra credit points from their teachers or a half letter grade increase in their class or exemption from homework for a week. Who doesn't like that? So it was a nice bonus for them, but what they really uh, came out of, the, what really came out of this experience was a much deeper sense of appreciation and understanding uh, of the world than they would, have had, they would have had from a textbook rundown of dry historical facts. So I don't think I can do it justice, you know, just by describing it in words. I think you kind of, you really had to experience it. <laughs> um, but this initiative really had a powerful impact on the entire student body, and as well as the administration. Um, it was really an unforgettable experience for them. Um, it was immersive, it was incentivized, and it reinforced positive behavior towards understanding global diversity. So to give you a sense of how uh, powerful the impact was, um, there was a teacher uh, at West Wollaston who had been teaching there for, I think, like over two decades. And she had really strong reservations um, about the MAPS initiative. You know, she thought it would be a waste of time and um, it would take away from her, her classroom learning time. So, you know, she, it was a mandatory assembly, you know, had a really, really supportive um, uh, uh, principal there. So, you know, he kind of made it a mandatory assembly for all to attend. Um, and then, at the conclusion of the program, uh, she actually became a convert. In her own words, she had written on the evaluation forms that I had handed out. Um, she said, seeing all of those students spontaneously take out their lighted cell phones and join as one unified body in the final rendition of John Lennon's Imagine brought tears to my eyes, as that was the ending of the, the show. I have never seen kids embrace any initiative so enthusiastically in my entire teaching career. Now that was powerful, but the instance that really moved me was regarding an immigrant Muslim girl who wore the traditional head garb, the hijab. Um, her parents had recently moved to West Boylston. And uh, you know, so she didn't really have a lot of friends at the school or within that community. Um, so she, and she tended to be very withdrawn, uh, guarded, you know, didn't speak up much, very likely in an effort to sort of deflect attention from herself. Um, but after the final MAPS uh, presentation, or the performance in which I convinced her to per participate, she sought me out and she said, Ms. Mirage, I finally feel like I belong in this school. I no longer fear others because they no longer fear me. Thank you for making this happen. So that was actually gut-wrenching for me. <laughs> that was my tearful moment. So I have given one, just one concrete uh, example of one gamified experience in one school in one town of Massachusetts. How do we scale this so that we have multiple examples in multiple schools across multiple towns in multiple states? So here's an idea. And I don't know how far-fetched this is, but if it can happen in one school, 
Why can't it happen in multiple schools? Why don't we take this concept of gamification, take it further, and encourage these schools to compete for the most effective, gamified, immersive experiences? Recognize these top performers, reward their accomplishments. This way, we are extending the notion of the playful village into an entire playful nation. Kids in every state can then have the opportunity to grow as true global citizens. So I've walked you through how gamification can address a very important social issue. Uh, I want to emphasize that we can use these same gamified approach to address other issues like health and wellness, financial security, policy change, almost anything. The application may be different, but the concept for using gamification remains the same. By tapping into our innate desire to compete, to grow, to be recognized for accomplishments, we really can play to learn and then play to win. So keep this one thing in mind. Gamification is not a tool. It's not even an abstract idea. It's really, you know, gamification is really a state of mind. Use it to solve any problem more efficiently, more effectively, all the while having more fun. Because if you're not going to have fun, then what's the point? So to conclude, um, I can't think of a better way to sum up my points than to leave you with a quote from the one and only Dr. Seuss, which I really think captures uh, the spirit of gamification. And this is from his book, Oh, the Places You'll Go. Oh, the places you'll go. There is fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Noreen. So you've talked a lot about the application of this to schools and students. Yes. I wonder if you could talk more about professional application. I'm really fascinated in, I mentioned the one example of trying to have workers list problems in the workplace, solve them, and then apply game aspects to make that a fun exercise. Can you give us some more examples of how it's used in adult professional forums? Absolutely, absolutely. So just to elaborate a little bit on this, um, you know, there's always workplace uh, issues going on. Employee engagement can often be a really big issue, you know, especially when you're working with multiple clients, um, you know, multiple partners and vendors. So it's really important to engage employees um, in the same way that we engage children. So I always used to joke about this um, when I first started out, you know, transitioning as a, from a guidance counselor for middle school and high school students to a guidance counselor for middle age students in the corporate world. Um, but basically, um, you have to give them a forum to speak up and then find ways to help them find their own solutions. So often what we do is, whether it's for imp internal employee engagement issues or for consumer-facing issues with clients, you know, get people together, and you can play games online or offline. I mean, it's not limited to you know, specific use of technology. It's all about the immersive experiences I was uh, talking about earlier. And get them to compete against each other um, in finding innovative solutions for their problems, because they're the ones who are immersed in that work environment. They're the ones who are doing it every day they're the ones who are going to come up with the best solutions. So allowing them a voice and an opportunity to bring out those ideas, and then we gamify it by rewarding them for participating in these type of initiatives. Is it tricky to find a way to do it that makes it grown up enough that adults will take it seriously, but fun enough that they're willing to participate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we don't necessarily go in and say, oh, we're going to play a game, uh, but you know, you have to make it engaging for them. There has to be an incentive. There's always the question of what's in it for me. So focusing on real life issues that are, you know, workplace issues that are affecting them, bringing them up as the design challenge, if you will, um, and then allowing them to pick it apart and come up with their own solution. So now it's important to them. It, you know, it helps their work life 
become better um, within that environment. And it also um, you know, helps them do their job better um, and just be more satisfied with their, with their job at the end of the day. So you have to just make sure that the focus is relevant to their work. You talked about the potential for an entire playful nation. And I wonder if you've tried to apply this, or do some people apply gamification to some of the most intractable political and global problems we have? Are there certain things that gamification might not work for? Or do you think it has potential even for those? So gamification can be applied to anything. Um, and you know, as much as I emphasize that, I do have to say that before you go off you know, throwing points and badges and applying this concept to issues, you have to make sure that you have an end goal. So yes, it can be applied to anything, but as long as you have an end goal and some direction to go in, because then it's just going to get frustrating and, and confusing. Um, so that helps you keep the focus, and then you um, enlist the right, the appropriate game, uh, gamification mechanics. And it's not just you know, the, the uh, obvious ones that I had talked about, you know, like the points and, and badges and such, but also the non-tangible sort of uh, um, less obvious but probably more critical ones of uh, just making sure that people are incentivized, um, that they're getting something personal out of it. In terms of bridging what you do now and what you used to do, when you think about what you've learned from a gamification, is there anything you would do differently now as a high school guidance counselor based on what you've learned about the psychology of this? Yeah, absolutely. So I introduced this because I really believed in it. You know, we used to call it token economy, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard or at least used that term. Um, but I think I would encourage it more. You know, not be scared to take that risk and put it out there and get people to utilize it. And there's so many more subtle ways to use it. You don't have to necessarily have a whole initiative going on. But I think just, you know, encouraging people to participate and um, helping the administration understand that small incentives go a long way. So I was new. Um, I was, you know, one of, my career was young when I started out and I, I created this initiative. Um, so, you know, sometimes it was easy for me to sort of step back and let the more experienced people do what they needed to do. But just to answer your question, what I would do more differently is really put that emphasis on there. And if it can't be a full running initiative like the MAPS program, you know, the example I gave, then just adding subtleties within their curriculum to incentivize the kids to do what they needed to do and also incentivize the uh, staff members to allow that type of environment. Noreen Raj, thank you. Thank you. Good to meet you. Thank you.